What's going on fellow art warriors? Welcome back to another painting process video and today we are going to be taking a look at a master study I did of John Singer Sargent's head of a Capri girl. So in this video I want to talk about why master studies are so important and how they can help you out. If you haven't um, liked and subscribed uh, the Art Bros channel this is a great time to do it but um, let's get into the video. In our Art Bros Discord server, we do a monthly study challenge. It will either be a photograph or another master study painting. And um, the idea is that we can all get together as a community and sort of work on one piece and just see how different people are approaching it. So guys, why are master studies so important? Well, it really helps you look through another artist's eyes, so to speak. Um, it, it takes a lot of guesswork out of everything because obviously you're trying to emulate a painting that has already solved all of the problems. But master studies are great because it will force you to um, simplify shapes and stylize things in a way maybe you hadn't thought of doing before. Again, because you're, you're trying to emulate somebody else's work. Um, I'd say that the approach is probably a little bit different from doing a photo study because with a photo study, obviously you're trying to interpret how to um, make the shapes and how to use your brush to, to capture the light and the values and stuff like that of, um, of the photo you're seeing or the you know still life or whatever, the real thing that you're, that you're seeing. But with master studies, it's, it's kind of interesting because you're, you're almost paying more attention to what the artist did to, um, to, to stylize like that thing that they're seeing. What was a, a little bit different this time around when I was working on this piece, I knew I was gonna be doing a video and I actually uh, would stop and write down some notes as I was painting and I've never done that before. And I'm, I might actually start doing this in the future and I'm gonna recommend you do that as well. It really helped me uh, work on something and then really think about why I was doing that thing. Why was I laying down those brush strokes? Why was I, you know, making this shape um, this way? Why was I putting this light value in front of this dark value? Stuff like that. And those are all hopefully things you'll, you'll see are apparent like through the, the painting video, the process video uh, that's going on behind me. So I spent about an hour and a half on this, uh, on this painting study. Uh, I, I typically don't like to spend too, too much more than an hour or so when I'm doing studies because the whole point in this study is just to ensure that you are learning something from it. You're not trying to create this beautiful piece of art because again, it's like you're, you're copying somebody else's art more or less. Um, you're just trying to, to take something away from that so that you can level up your own skill when you get to your imaginative piece or your, you know, beautiful painting that you're working on. My process is, is pretty standard, especially for these studies. If you guys have seen our other videos, um, you'll know what I'm talking about, but I usually start with a super loose line drawing. Again, like if I was doing client work, um, my approach would be would be different. It would be a little bit more well thought out and planned out. But with these studies, it's kind of fun to just like almost go on one or two layers, just bang it out and just kind of let your mind loose and let your hand loose. And I think that in itself is also a really good practice because it, it forces you to commit to your painting strokes and commit to your colors, commit to your values. Um, you're not doing as much uh, noodling because you're kind of just painting all over and just trying to get it as similarly to the reference as you possibly can. So after I do my loose line drawing, I put a background in, and again, that's super loose. And this is something that I see quite a lot, especially with um, more amateur artists. Uh, they, they either neglect any sort of value or color in the background, or um, they, it's more of an afterthought. And what I've found, especially if you're working on, you know, only a couple layers and you're trying to build up that, that painting confidence, putting some color and some value into your background is really going to help you uh, keep the, the color scheme of the painting consistent. Because what, what you have to think about is if you, uh, let's, you know, we're, we're referencing a, uh, a portrait, right? If that person's head is surrounded by whatever color is behind them, those colors are going to be reflecting off onto the face. So I would almost um, pick some colors from the background and blend them into the into the portrait 
to again, kind of get everything feeling a lot more consistent. Um, that's when we get a lot of our uh, really good color variation in, and not so much just like your like local color, like here's a peach tone for skin and white for the shirt or whatever. You're getting a lot, a lot of variation when you're kind of mixing all of these colors around. And this is, you know, a lot more similar to the, to the way um, traditional oil painters would paint. You know, they have a limited palette and they use just those colors to be mixing around to create a, a piece. And um, while it does limit you a lot more than, you know, you'd be limited in Photoshop, it also kind of helped because, you know, you're not having to think in um, millions of colors. You're having to think in like, you know, five to 10 different colors and how you can mix those colors to create new colors. Um, so you also notice that I am using pretty much, I think I used one brush for the entire painting. I'll paste a little snippet of that um, in the window above so you can kind of see like the grain structure of what that brush looked like. But especially for these studies too, I like to have something that, you know, if I press really hard, I can make a really thick stroke. If I press, press a little bit more lightly, I'll, I'll get a lot of that grain. What that helps with is when you're trying to blend, those grains interlock with each other and they get the appearance of, of the, the paint being smooth, especially when you zoom your canvas out. Um, I think what, again, a lot of more amateur artists try to do is they try to blend everything. And there are some styles I, I, I would say that, you know, lend itself to that. But if you are trying to go for that more traditional, like rough oil painting kind of look, like that's how a realistic, you know, paintbrush would, would work as well. The bristles would make the strokes, the little tiny lines, and they kind of like end up interlocking and, and blending together. Um, you will see later on too that I end up using the mix, mixer brush quite a lot as well. And what that helped me achieve was I was trying to emulate that wet paint sort of blended look. And what that does in Photoshop is it basically uh, smears the pixels together um, with the colors that are next to it. So it like really feels like you're actually like smudging something or blending something as opposed to just like blurring it together. So I recommend you guys play around with the mixer brush. I don't really use it unless I am really, really trying to blend something and try to trying to achieve um, a certain like look or quality of my paint. Like, but um, it, it's, it's really hard to like paint a whole painting with just a mixer brush. So yeah, just play around with it, mess around with the settings and you can look at my settings as well and see kind of what I'm doing. I block in that background and then I'm also blocking in these really, really big shapes first. Like I'm looking specifically like at the eye sockets or making these more darker values because the light is kind of pointing at an angle. I'm tr really trying to work up um, my my values so that it's almost like um, if you were to put a posterized filter on your painting, you'd still be able to capture the essence of the piece with just these big like chunks of color and value. And, and at the end of the day, that's what we want to try to achieve. Um, that's the best way to think about painting because it's kind of like we are just thinking in shapes and it's it just so happens the shapes keep getting smaller and smaller as you detail on. But, you know, if you have like your forehead in a, in a certain sort of value range, you're kind of picking colors that, that fit within that range um, so that, you know, you can identify like, okay, is this in the light area or is this in the shadow area? And that's just gonna keep your piece, um, your lights and your darks feeling as separated as possible. It's also going to help your piece read as very three-dimensional. You'll notice too, um, going back to the, talking about the color really quick, what I did um, for this specific piece was I, I, I made my my Coloris uh, little plug-in color palette thing really, really small and I put it right next to my painting. What that kind of helped me do was really narrow down on, on specific uh, colors and forced me to really do a lot of my blending and my and my value work within my painting as opposed to to being so like subtle and nudging things around it forced me to like pick a value lay a slab down and then kind of mix that as as needed and I, again i don't really do that for every painting but for this because there are these like you know this really um heavy transition between light and dark it helped me to really push myself in thinking about like specifically what colors and how dark and light those colors were when I was putting the strokes down. 
All right, so a couple things I was thinking about while I was actually in the process of detail, detailing and kind of just chipping away at the painting was my stroke consistency. So I was trying my best to emulate John Singer Sargent's uh, painting strokes. And he makes these big, confident, you know, strokes to really uh, define the shapes. And what I also noticed while I was painting was that um, the strokes he was making conform around the edges of, of whatever thing he's painting. So for example, um, like on the shoulder, you'll notice there's like painting strokes that, that kind of curve around the shoulder. And what that helps the, the viewer's eye do is automatically understand that there's a curve to that shape without you having to chisel away and chip away at kind of really detailing out that form. It's kind of like if you can get the idea across of what you're trying to do with as little strokes as possible, your image is just gonna read all that much better. The other thing I was really paying attention to was the flow and patterning of my piece. So what that what I mean by that is that, um, you know, the face is obviously the most important part of this painting. So the face needs to be much, much more rendered than the rest of the piece. That doesn't mean that, you know, necessarily the edges need to be totally sloppy or loose or whatever, but there's just sort of this uh, gradual pattern you wanna see, especially if the the face is right in the center, you want to try to lead the, the user's or the, the viewer's eye closer and closer to the center. So what that means is, you know, darkening the edges a little bit might help, especially if the face is rather bright and um, using some tricks to really pop the face out as well. So uh, one thing that a lot of traditional or, you know, portrait painters tend to do is if they're um, hitting one side of the face with light, that means behind the, the portrait, the, the person's head, it's a little bit darker. And then on the darker side of the face, it's a little bit lighter. And what that really does is it causes this sort of like yin and yang, yin and yang sort of balance, and it really pushes everything out and pops it out. So that's a really easy trick to try. You know, you can do that with your concept art as well. If you have like a figure kind of just standing there, you know, kind of like do more of a, um, you know, loose sort of patterned uh, background, like a paint strokey background and, and play around with those lights and darks in contrast to where the lights and darks are on the character. And that's gonna really push them out. So the other thing I was really, really paying attention to was um, the, the expression on the face. So I wasn't particularly concerned with this study in, um, you know, making sure the drawing aspect of it was the best drawing I've ever done. Um, I was focusing more on the painting aspect. And again, this is what you want to try to keep in mind when doing a study is just like, what are you trying to get out of it, right? But I do know that specifically for this painting, the, the, um, the girl's face has this very sort of somber emotion to it, almost like a sly sort of look. And um, I spent quite a while trying to capture that. I, I don't think I... 100% nailed it because I don't think anybody can nail it except for um, Sargent, but I think I got pretty close. I think that um, I stylized some things like I, I made the eyes a little bit bigger and some of the features just a little bit more dramatic than on his piece, which didn't lend itself to the realism as much. Um, but these are things that I was kind of noticing like after the painting, it's kind of like when you're in the process, you don't uh, pick up on those things so much but again i only spent an hour and a half on this if i was spending you know three five hours on this i would really be trying to like meticulously get getting this um exactly the way i wanted to but it's just something to keep in mind that you know obviously the expression on a portrait is super important and you want to try your best to capture that um, another thing that was really cool that i noticed specifically when when working on this painting was that he, um, sergeant uses a lot of grays um, on rather warm pieces to pull out a cool feel. And um, this goes hand in hand with like pretty heavy color theory, but it's very easy to, to, uh, to test this yourself. Basically all you have to do is like put up like a, a swatch of like maroon or like a dark red or something like that. And then paint just like a, a, a gray, like a rather gray red on top of that. And you'll automatically see that it almost looks like blue, like blue light is hitting it. It's like magic, right? But I think what a lot of, um, again, a lot of more younger amateur artists 
tend to tend to neglect is is this sort of subtle um, contrast in colors. And there's a way to kind of achieve like a full color gamut or something that looks like a full color spectrum with again a limited palette. Um, I'd recommend you guys check out the Zorn palette as well. That's like I don't know like a five paint color palette and um, you can pretty much paint anything you want just from those five colors and a lot of it has to do with um, tricking the user's eye into thinking certain colors are you know either warmer or cooler based on the context of the painting so on on this piece specifically you'll see where the hair parts where maybe this is lit by a was lit by a window originally like it wasn't like a light bulb or direct sunlight maybe it's window lit which is casting a bit more of a cool light on her face you're seeing some of that cool light on the top of her hair um so yeah, I really recommend playing around with that. It's, it's really fun and uh, you'll, you'll be able to create some new color palettes that you wouldn't normally uh, do otherwise. So yeah, guys, that about wraps it up for uh, this explanation on my painting process. I hope you found that helpful. Again, if you haven't uh, liked or subscribed, please do that. If you guys aren't in the Discord as well, we have about 4,500 artists that are all sharing work working on challenges and doing really awesome stuff in there. I'll leave the link in the description below. And until next time, guys, keep on painting, keep on studying, keep on drawing. See you guys. Perfect.